As I was listening to Brandon share that story about the Welsh revival, I just couldn't help uh, sitting there thinking, you think God can do it again? Do you think he would if we would ask him to? If we would pray about that? It might take years. But I don't know about you, but that's something I've been praying for. Sometimes I, I, I walk around downstairs in the middle of the day, and I'll walk through the Sunday school rooms, and I'll just ask God to fill up these rooms. I'll ask God to convict our hearts so that we'll confess sin that's getting in the way of God's Holy Spirit using us. I'll ask the Lord to save souls. And friends, we, we need to be doing that all the time, because I really do believe you heard what he said? One guy, one guy was praying when, when everybody else gave up hope. And I don't believe the Lord's given up hope on this country. I definitely don't believe he's given up hope on this church. We have great things happening here, but I think he could do so, so much more. So let's just take that before the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we just rejoice in and knowing who you are and what you've done for us and the fact that we can even be here and be able to come before you and, and to talk to you and for it to be real and not just to be some ritual that we do but but to really know you and to be known by you lord it's just such an awesome thing and father i just want to pray this morning that as we look into your word as we look into something that David wrote long ago, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take it and that he will use it in speaking to our hearts, and showing us things that you want us to see, and that, Lord, our response will be just to throw open wide the doors and to give you the keys to every room in our house and so that you can have complete control over us. And use us how you want to, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever feel like God's just kind of far away? I mean, you, you know in your head that he's there, but it just seems like, man, did something else get his attention? Because it sure doesn't seem like he's paying any attention to me at all right now. He just seems so far away. Or do you ever feel like something that's on your mind is really bugging you? It's something you're thinking about, you're worried about, and, and yet you think, well, God couldn't possibly be interested in this. I mean, look at what's going on over in Africa and, and all the wonderful thing that happened in Thailand when they rescued all those kids. That, that was fantastic. Praise the Lord for it. But man, God's got all this other stuff going on in the world. He couldn't possibly be interested in my little problems. You ever felt that way? Or have you ever just wished that somebody really knew you? You ever been in a place in your life where you just wish, I, I wish somebody understood me. I wish somebody knew where I come from, knew what I'm thinking, really understood the struggles that I have, but I, I just feel like nobody gets me. And and nobody gets me, nobody understands me, and sometimes I wonder if anybody even really cares. Or do you ever, maybe sometimes you just don't like you. You ever had one of those days or one of those months where you just didn't like you? And you didn't like the color of your hair, you don't like the, you know, your ears are too big, your eyes are too small, your figure's not nice enough, your muscles aren't big enough. You wish that you were, you know, better looking. You wish you were more athletic. Or maybe it's something with your personality. You wish that you weren't so sensitive. Or, or maybe you wished you were more sensitive so you could understand your wife better. Or you, you wish that there was some aspect of your personality that could change. You wish you weren't given to talking so much. Or maybe you wish that you found it easier to talk more because you just can't carry on a conversation, it seems like. You ever wish there was something about you, something about your personality that, that was different? Or maybe there's something that, you, know, you ever do something and you just don't know why you do it? Maybe even sometime when you've, when you've hurt somebody 
some word comes sailing out of your mouth you didn't even know was in your vocabulary. And, and there it is. And somebody got hurt. And you don't even know why you said it. Or you did something and you don't know why you did it. And, and have you ever just sort of come face to face or had somebody point something out to you? That, and so you found something in your own heart that just really shocked you? You ever had that happen? Where you see hatred towards somebody? Or bitterness that has, has been laying there for years and you didn't realize it was a problem? Or maybe envy that you, you're jealous of somebody. You're jealous of their good looks, their talent, their girlfriend, their job their husband? And have you ever found motives, reasons that you found that you were doing things that, man, you just, you just never really realized were there? Well, during the past several weeks, we have been studying and looking at the life of David. And if you'll turn this morning to Psalm 139, before we leave this I guess you could call it high point in David's life where we left him last week when God made this great promise to him that he was going to build a house out of his family. We're going to look at this psalm that David wrote, and we don't know exactly when David wrote this, but as God moved David to write these words down, I want to tell you this is one of the most intensely personal passages in all the Bible that you will ever read. It's a song of praise that David sings to the Lord. It's a psalm of praise that he wrote to the Lord, but it's not so much about David talking about how great it is for him to know God, but rather how awesome it is that God knows him. Because God sees that person that you really are on the inside. And that person who you really are on the inside, at the end of the day, folks, that's where it's at. Because at the end of the day, that person on the inside is the one who has to decide whether or not he is going to open himself, open herself up to know and be known by the one who already knows everything, already knows everything about you. But you have to decide whether you're going to willingly open yourself up to that and receive him in. Or if you're going to reject him, close the door, try to step back into the darkness until that awful day called the day of judgment when God is going to peel everything back and reveal who you are to the whole world. Look with me if you would in Psalm 139. In verse 1, it says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The first thing we see David, that David writes about here is he is just awestruck with God's knowledge and God's intimate knowledge of him. There's a couple of words here, a few words here that are very interesting that I want to to take a look at and and, and examine. First of all, he says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now, does that strike you as a little bit funny? Just think about it a minute. If God is all-knowing and God sees everything, why does he have to search for anything? What does it mean when he says, God, you have searched me and known me? Why, why does God do that? Well, what this is showing us is that God doesn't know you just because he's God and he knows everything and knows everything about everything. But God is intentional. He is deliberate in how he knows you. This, the word search means to examine, to investigate, to scrutinize. God, God 
intensely, he is intensely interested in you and in everything about you. In fact, David says, he says, you know, when I sit down and when I rise up, and you think, well, that's kind of boring. I mean, why would you be interested in when somebody sits down or rises up? Ever had a crush on somebody? Man, I remember when I first started noticing Dorcas, and I knew I really liked her a lot. Man, when she would walk into a room, I knew every time she sat down and when she rised up. <laughs> oh, she's getting up. She's going to go get a cookie. <laughs> oh, somebody drops. Oh, look, she's bending down. She's picking that up off the floor. Man, she's good looking. <laughs> and, and I noticed everything she did. I was intensely interested in Dorcas. And, and right now, she's holding my granddaughter. And we've been, we've been waiting to see her and Ethan and Becky for, <laughs> for a really long time. And let me ask you, do you think that all of us are intensely interested in when Kinsley Ann sits down and when she rises up? I mean, we take pictures. <laughs> look, she's sitting up. Oh, oh, look, here's a video. She's eating. <laughs> you know, we are. intensely interested we are purposefully interested in Kinsley Ann and everything about her and folks I hope you get what what this is saying here is that is how God is interested in you every one of you God is intensely interested in you and everything you do and not just the first time you do it but all through your whole life he is intensely interested in everything you do. And not only that, but David goes on. He says, you discern my thoughts from afar. And discernment speaks not just of, of knowing something, but of understanding it. He understands why you're thinking the way you're thinking, even when you don't understand it yourself. You ever try to, uh, guys, I'll just say, you ever try to figure your wife out? Ever been a time when your wife was upset and you just didn't have a clue what in the world she upset about? Ever been there? Oh, come on, I can't be the only one. <laughs> and, you know, maybe she's there crying and, and what's wrong? I don't know what's wrong. Well, can I help? No, you can't do anything. <laughs> it's like, how do you understand that? But, you know, God understands it. God comprehends it because God made her. And ladies, how about you? you? You ever say something and then you just watch? My goodness. And, and you just wonder, what's eating him? But God knows what's eating him. And God understands it because God made your husband. And you see, and sometimes we don't even understand ourselves. Sometimes I don't understand what I'm mad about. Sometimes I don't understand why I wake up one morning, I just feel like everything's hopeless. You know, everything just looks black. I don't know why I feel that way. There's no reason. But God understands it. He, he understands and he, he discerns our thought from afar off. And then he says this. He says, you search out my path and my lying down. You search out, you scrutinize my journeyings is the way the New American Standard translates it. And you know what that word search out, that word scrutinize really means? It means to winnow. You know what, what winnowing is? It's like when you take some, some crop like wheat, a little grain that grows in a hole, and after you harvest that, after you cut it down, you have to winnow it. You have to separate the hull from the grain. And, and lots of times you beat it down, you beat it, beat it, beat it, and then you toss it up in the air. And I've, been in, I've never had a chance to harvest wheat, but I used to help the awa harvest rice every once in a while. And then they would go through this process of just flipping it up in the air, flipping it up in the air, flipping it up in the air. So So at the end of the day, there is not one bit, there is not one grain that hasn't been touched by that winnowing process. 
And what God is saying, you winnow my path and my lying down. You search out every single detail of, of my journeyings. And I was just thinking about Brandon this past week. Um, you know, Brandon went out to the West Coast for their vacation. And when they get get to the airport in LA and Brandon had already made all his arrangements he had the car rented he had his name signed everything was all set and he gets there and they say well where's your credit card you know I don't have a credit card well how did you how did you reserve the car well well I did it online online it says you can do it with a debit card oh uh, I don't know I don't know if we can do that or not you know and so he goes and talks to his manager and Brandon's there just he was telling me about this he's just sweating bullets because, I mean, he's got to get from L.A. to Spokane, Washington. And he's counting on this car. I mean, their whole trip's planned around this. You know, and in the end, they talk to the manager, and the manager comes out. And, oh, okay, well, no, I guess it's all right, but you've got to give us some references. And, and, and anyway, the Lord took care of it. But you think any of that took the Lord by surprise? No, God had winnowed their trip out. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew when it was going to happen. He knew why it was going to happen. And he had it under control. And he took care of it. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Now that word acquainted, we, we use a little bit differently. Because somebody will ask me sometimes, hey, do you know so-and-so? And I'll say, well, yeah, I'm acquainted with them. And what do I mean by that? Well, that just kind of comes across like, well, yeah, I know who they are. I've talked to them once or twice, but, but we're not really close. I, I'm acquainted with them. That's not what this word means. The New American Standard adds a word there that brings out the meaning of this word acquainted in the original. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. That's a whole different meaning. If you say you, you are intimately acquainted with somebody, that, that, that speaks of something quite different. And I remember back when we were in Ecuador, lots of times Dorcas and I would have to go to meetings. There would be, you know, field committee meetings or sometimes team meetings. And some, every once in a while something kind of interesting would happen. We would go to a meeting and we would come out of it. And then we'd be sitting there eating lunch or Dorcas and I would be driving on our way home. And she would say, you were really mad when so-and-so was talking, weren't you? And I would be amazed because I was really mad, but I didn't say anything. I didn't even think I changed my facial expression. But Dorcas knew I was mad. And you know how she knew I was mad? Because she is intimately acquainted with me. I mean, I don't know whether it is. It's like my jaws twitch. or I don't even know what I do, but somehow she knows. She knows that I'm mad. And the same thing's true with her. I can walk into the kitchen and if she's there doing dishes and she's irritated about something, it's, it's like you ever see the heat rising from a car on a hot day? <laughs> I mean, it's almost like I can just see these vapors coming off of her and it's like, oh, she's irritated about something. I don't even know how I know that, but I just know it's because I'm intimately acquainted with her. And we've been married for 32 years and, and we are intimately acquainted with each other. But let me tell you, God is more intimately acquainted with you than Dorcas and I are with each other. He knows everything about you. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows what you're going to think before you think it and why you're going to think it. He hears everything that you, that you say. He hears the thoughts in your head. He knows the motives in your heart. He knows everything about you. And even sometimes when we can't figure this out, And, and, he, and he finishes on with this. He has this one last thing he says in this section. He says, you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. God's prayer. presence with us but man I tell you Satan sure understands it because you remember what it was that he said to Job when they were having their little conversation about why Job served the Lord 
he said to Job, well, of course he, he, he serves him. He says, does, does Job serve God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he had? Satan knew. He was very aware of the hedge that God had put around Job. And he knew that he couldn't touch him without God's permission. And the upshot of what David's saying here is there's nothing you can think that God doesn't know. There's nothing you can say that God doesn't hear. There's nothing you can do that he doesn't see and is fully aware of and why you do it. And David is just amazed by this and he, and he comes out and he just says, this, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. But, but I want to tell you something here before I go on to that. Is, is how does that make you feel? You know, this, this personal intimate knowledge that God has of you it's either going to be good news or it's going to be bad news and you see what it all depends upon is your relationship because on the one hand it's a wonderful thing to think well well, God knows where I'm at and he understands my personality and he understands my feelings. He really gets me. He never leaves me. He never takes his eyes off of me. That's all wonderful. But it's also true that God also sees everything that you would prefer stay hidden. God knows what's going on in your heart right now or that person that you've got a problem with. God knows what you've been looking at this week. He knows what's on your web browser. He knows what's on your phone. Nothing. we can do to hide any of it in the book of hebrews it says no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account and this being perfectly intimately known by god is is, is either going to be good news or it's going to be bad news and it all depends on our relationship Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And I give to them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one is open. Opening yourself up to that all-knowing gaze and that perfect knowledge as God looks into your heart and he shows you those things that do not line up with who he is and who he created you to be. That's what the Bible calls sin. And sooner or later, if you're going to be known by the shepherd and, 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 and know him, that's what's got to be dealt with. This is what the Bible says about it. He says in 1 John um, chapter 1, he says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Nothing wrong with me. I'm okay. I'm, I'm just as good as the next guy. What are you talking about sin for? You're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. But he says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you've come to a point where you stop trying to hide your sin and you opened yourself wide and you say, God, you see it, you know it, there's nothing I can do to hide it from you. And Lord, I, I'm calling it what it is. You call it sin, I know it is.
to die on that cross, that that was for me. And that was to take care of my sin. That was to wipe me clean. That was to change me from the person I am. So, Lord, please take this sin away. I don't want to be this way anymore. And you see, that's how Jesus becomes your shepherd. That's how the Lord really becomes your shepherd, as David talked about in the, in the 23rd Has a of you becomes a blessing instead of something fearful you know of a judge standing over you with perfect knowledge of everything you've done and the authority to punish you now you have a loving father who has received you as his adopted child and who loves you intensely is intensely interested in everything that you do And is there to love you and to help you and to guide you through life. And he's your advocate. And yeah, you're going to sin from time to time. But when you do, you repent, you confess it, he forgives you, and you go right on walking with him. It all depends on the relationship. And and what What is man that you would take thought of him? You know, David, David got this. And he said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. It blows, it, it blows my mind, he's saying. But then he goes on from God's perfect knowledge of him to God's presence with him. He talks about God's covering presence. Look what it says in verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, right as the The day for darkness is as light with you. And the simple question is, is, is there any place you can go where God's not there? I remember the first time that I used a GPS on a phone to get somewhere. And we all do that all the time now. It's pretty commonplace. But this was uh, several years ago. I believe it was when we were down in Myrtle Beach on vacation. And uh, Andy and I had gone across town to the grocery store, and the one grocery store was closed, so we had to meander around and go someplace else. And Myrtle Beach isn't the easiest place to get around, I mean. And so, and so anyway, it was dark, it was nighttime, and I didn't really know where I was at and wasn't sure the best way to get back to the hotel. And Andy says, well, I'll just tell the phone. And he says, okay, you know, and so, okay, Google, directions to Holiday Inn, Myrtle Beach South. And the thing pops up on the screen, and it shows you exactly where you're at. I was like, man, this thing knows exactly where I'm at. It's amazing. I, I know, you know, it's, I, I'm an old guy. I'm still kind of <laughs> impressed by technology. But you know, God doesn't need a GPS to find you. <laughs> he doesn't even have to find you. Because what we saw just a minute ago, he never takes his hand off of you. And when you look at at the way David elaborates on this is really fascinating. He says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. Now, that's not too surprising because that's kind of where we expect God to. is a Hebrew word that means the netherworld was Mourning and crying over Joseph when his brother is speaking.
speaking about a place of darkness. In fact, Jesus talked about hell more than he talked. And if you want a perfect picture of this, just take a look at Jonah. Because what did Jonah do? You know, the Lord tells Jonah, hey, go and preach to the people at Nineveh so that they will repent. Well, Jonah didn't like the people at Nineveh. He didn't want them to repent. And so Jonah goes and he gets in a boat and he goes as far away as he can possibly go in the opposite direction. And not only did he get in a boat and go as far away, you know, across the sea, but he even goes down into the depths of the boat in the lowest part of the boat so that he can hide. And, of course, you know the story. And he... answered me out of the belly of field trip back when I was in high school and we went to the New River Cave But you know, the fact is, I believe that to the drug or the pornographic website or for you You call out to him just like he was waiting for Jonah. Hold me. Your right hand will guide me. Wonder. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well.
I was reading a survey this past week where he's about stuff, but in fact, the matter is they do. If says, I, I really like that shirt, would you wear it? You know, then, then I'll... And I I couldn't stand it because my hair would never lay the way I want. There's so many. So much. Because I would get so... I wish that I wasn't someone who just naturally wonderful. Are your works. My soul knows it. That if I was not praising God, you're saying that. But he gave you man. In a woman's body, you're putting a woman in a man's body. And before we leave this, this, this section and move on to the last.
when the job that was supposed to be How precious to me are your thoughts, O Jew. I hate them with complete hatred and no me and know my heart and all that and and what you have to keep was not just God's spiritual light to the world they were all see that every ever lived was the nation of Israel. That ended when the And, and, and people who have tried to do that down to, for we do. Do not wrestle against flesh and blood. People are not on the television. You are being bombarded. Off the opinions raised against the knowledge of me that you can't see. How do you fight?
to hide God's word in your heart. Two years. I was here, I memorized about 200 verses of Scripture. This section. And he says, how precious to me are your thoughts. Are God... You see the connection here? Every door. Every cabinet, every drawer, everything. To say these last words as a prayer. Did God put a finger on something in your life? As we come to you today and Lord, I know, pray, Lord, that you'll give them the courage to do that.